Welcome to the uh, last, last session of the day. Hope you've all had a good day. Um, we're going to talk to you this afternoon about a project that we did called Spiders Net Infinity, which was about creating a site factory using Drupal and A-Gear. So I run a company called Miggle. We're based in Brighton in England. There are 11 of us. We work for the, um, the local National Health Service, Air New Zealand, Yahoo, NBC Universal, a range of other clients. And uh, today, myself, our lead developer, Steve, and one of our senior developers here, and we'll be talking you through how we, um, how we approach this project. And uh, this project was something that we delivered for a classifieds business. We wanted to run a platform that would enable them to deliver a range of um, websites for automotive dealers, of which this is an example. So we have a um, hashtag which you can use for questions, comments, or, or feedback. Any feedback would be greatly appreciated because this is only the uh, second time we've done this uh, presentation. So like with everything, there'll always be room for improvement. So we'd appreciate that. Or alternatively, you could just um, tweet the mate and model of your, of your first car. So that's my, um, that was my first car, a um, 1972 red Vauxhall Viva. It wasn't actually that one. My one looked in a slightly poorer shape than, than that one. But uh, yeah, that's the hashtag for the, uh, for the presentation. And um, what we'll be covering, we'll look at the uh, business objectives um, and how we man about requirements gathering uh, and replacing the existing solution. We'll cover systems architecture and specifically how we use Drupal and A-Gear, um, cover something on the platform code base talk about how we collaborated with the client and how we then strive to kind of give them the independence to run that solution and how we manage change as part of that and then what the kind of thing looks like going forward and in terms of how we delivered that and try to allow the client to have a level of flexibility in that and then at the end of it we'll take any questions that you have. So our client, um, a part of a uh, larger classifieds group called the Friday <laughs> Media Group um, that group was founded in 1975 um, in an offline environment. If you live in the UK, if you think about Loot Magazine, it's very, very similar to that. Uh, Friday ad predominantly kind of based uh, uh, south and southeast of England is where, it's, is where it's strongest. But the business as a whole has an international reach and it's got 75 dedicated uh, classified properties across a range of sectors. So all the obvious ones like jobs, property and motors, but also some... Uh, some niche ones as well, like guns, adults, horses, uh, boats, and uh, forklift trucks. Um, and they've kind of done that by acquiring a range of sector specialists as, um, as time has gone on. And uh, one of those is, uh, is one in the motor sector called SpidersNet. So this is an automotive online services company. It was founded by an ex-motor dealer who had uh, 20 years experience. It was started in 1997, and the Friday Media Group acquired it, I believe, in 2000, 2004. And um, they broadcast all of their classified uh, listings to a range of other aggregators. Um, so the obvious ones like Parker's, uh, um, eBay, and uh, Autotrader being kind of the, some of the largest ones in the, in the UK, and then a range of other aggregators as well. So why did SpidersNet need a new platform? Well, the um, structure of their existing platform wasn't manageable anymore. And specifically with that, they found hiring in talent to run that uh, platform an issue. Um, there was no real sustainability, <coughs> repeatability, or standardization. Um, although what they had in essence was a platform, it had kind of got to a stage where pretty much each site was its own entity. And all of those sites were managed with, um, with zero level of version control. Uh, they also wanted to kind of get to a position where they could have um, more structured pl products that were better placed competitively. So to maybe have like a, an express offering, an advanced offering, and, a, and an elite offering. Uh, I guess they also wanted to kind of, you know, replace the kind of death by a thousand cuts syndrome and create instead an opportunity to innovate and grow, grow their business and also to be able to kind of provide more power to their car dealers, so give those car dealers 
tools that they could use to actually kind of manage the sites that they, um, that they had bought. In terms of how we saw the project, we actually saw it as a really big piece of change management across the whole business. Um, you know, the project was going to represent substantial change, uh, both from a technical perspective, but also from a, from a sales and admin perspective as well. You know, top to bottom, it was going to really change the way the whole business, whole business worked. And obviously, while we were um, building that new platform, part of it would involve us having to kind of reskill the existing team but that team would also have to kind of maintain kind of business as usual by running what they had in place already to be able to service all of their other clients. So we're going to use a bunch of kind of motoring analogies in this um, presentation. And what we kind of said to them earlier on is that your use at the moment to be able to drive in a straight line, kind of go as fast as you can, but obviously you can't kind of maintain that speed as you kind of go around corners or as you go around a steep learning curve. So, um, you know, you might find that you have to kind of slow down a little bit while you kind of consolidate all of the uh, new learns that you have to kind of take into, take into account. Also, from our perspective, um, as a business, Miggle believe that if you have tightly defined, in, uh, tightly defined products, that that really improves your uh, ability to position yourself competitively. And as a result, it could simplify the sales process and also simplify the development process. So compared to a scenario where there were none of those restrictions in place, we kind of said to the existing team, you know, that might feel like kind of putting the handbrake on, where maybe in the kind of current scenario, you don't actually have a handbrake on the car at all. So that in itself might feel, you know, a little bit odd going forward. In terms of actually defining what that change looked like, um, we did a discovery phase in the first instance to um, determine product deliverables, to look at the existing capabilities of the platform, to uh, clarify all of the business objectives, to look at what the technical requirements of the new platform would be, and to also look at what the training requirements would be in terms of reskilling the existing team. And um, ultimately, the output of that was a product requirements document or a, or a PRD. And in terms of building that PRD, uh, we wanted to kind of make that process as collaborative as possible. So. We put the whole thing together using um, Google Docs, just created a folder in Google Docs. The main thing was a, was a kind of document within that, but there were various spreadsheets that would list things like uh, you know, content types, taxonomies, you know, so on and so forth, and kind of shared that with the client from a, from a very early stage, from a kind of first draft stage, allowed them to use the kind of commenting functionality in Google Docs to actually kind of feedback on specific parts and um, got that to a point where we had what we felt was a comprehensive document that outlined everything that we needed to do as part of that project. Once that had been signed off, we then broke all those various tasks out into um, JIRA and used that as our means of managing, managing development. So during that discovery phase, we spent quite a lot of time actually sitting with the uh, SpidersNet business. So you can imagine we've this business as part of a larger classifieds group. You know, they've got an enormous floor with people sitting all around it. You've got the boats business in one corner, the horses business in another corner, the cars business in another corner. And then within an individual group, you've got all of the sales and the admin and the developers all kind of sit together. So it's a, you know, it's a fairly kind of, um, you know, kind of close knit environment. And, um, you know, we sat and wrote a lot of the original kind of uh, documentation, uh, you know, with, with the team, so we were able to kind of see a lot about how the business ran and how the, um, how the current technology was used. Um, and what we saw was, you know, they were a very responsive, customer-focused business. They had a knowledgeable and helpful sales and admin team. The uh, product team had a real can-do attitude and were very adept at finding um, clever solutions to facilitate the kind of things that dealers were asking for. And all around there was kind of generally good kind of processes and uh, team spirit, at least in terms of kind of managing client requests as they, as they came in. However, that whole kind of can-do attitude and, you know, and wanting to kind of keep the ha customer happy had had a fairly significant impact on the integrity of the existing platform and product. And I have that platform product in, um, in quotes because in reality when we looked at it, we didn't, we didn't really see it as a platform. We just saw it as like a bunch of code 
that was just used and copied, so all running off a of Windows server, go into Windows File Explorer, right click on the folder, copy it, move it into another folder, start building your new site from the most relevant site that you'd, that you'd kind of copied it from. So, you know, we didn't really see that as a platform. And um, for us, when we kind of think about platform, there's a real sanctity to platforms. You know, platforms kind of do a certain thing and you, you don't deviate from that. And you have very, very kind of strict rules around what a platform is and what a platform isn't. And, um, but then from the client perspective, all that they really wanted to do was put themselves into a position where their dealers were able to kind of sell, sell more cars. So we had to kind of get that, that balance right between offering them flexibility while still maintaining platform control. And one of the questions that we were constantly asked through the whole discovery process is, you know, will flexibility be compromised? You know, so we had to be honest about that and say, well, yeah, in the short term, you know, that's inevitable that flexibility is going to be compromised. So you have nothing boundary in what you can do at the moment. You know, if we're going to wrap boundaries around that, then that's going to, you know, create some, some level of kind of compromisation in the first instance. But in the longer term, that might not necessarily be the case. However, to best manage that flexibility, we really feel that the, the best way to do that is to have a much greater product knowledge and also a much greater kind of business knowledge and competitive positioning knowledge than what you might have in the first instance. And we think it's easier then to be flexible when you have um, you know, established product variants. So you say, this Express feature or this Express product you know, just has these particular features, the advanced product has these features, the elite one has these features and so on. Um, to have a roadmap that says, this is how these product variants are gonna kind of grow over time. And ideally for that roadmap to be socialized, not just within the business, but potentially with, um, with clients as well. Obviously internally, and particularly from a development perspective, for not just being able to kind of develop sites in Drupal, but actually having an all round better knowledge of what Drupal could do and to be, and to be aware of that. And um, yeah, and generally to have more shared knowledge about their competitors and also the features most requested by um, clients across the sector. You know, so don't necessarily try and get one product out to market just because you've got one dealer asking for it. If none of your competitors or none of your other dealers are asking for anything remotely, remotely similar. So that was how we kind of approached um, product requirements gathering and discovery and thought that we had a pretty good handle on what was required. But <coughs> What we ended up doing anyway is that we hopefully, hopelessly underestimated the task at hand. And uh, so obviously that had an impact. So what was the impact of that? Well, the initial delivery took longer. Um, Spider's net business priorities changed over the course of the um, discovery period. When we were first briefed, it was very much about the fact that we want a platform that enables us to basically throw these express sites out of the door in two to three hours and we want to grow the number of express sites that we're, um, that we're selling and get those out of the door as easy, as easy as possible. But then over the period of us kind of going through the discovery process, they thought about it and said, actually, we don't really make much money on the express sites. It's more about us being able to kind of sell more elite and advanced sites, which obviously require greater flexibility within the platform. So initially our heads are in this kind of realm of actually delivering like a real cookie cutter s solution where, you know, a, which would have been really easy to do on a platform um, basis. Whereas actually we had to kind of think about how we could deliver something where potentially kind of sites could go off in kind of different directions and different variants, but still be managed by the same kind of consistent feature base and code base. Um, obviously, as with all projects, the devil's in the detail and the uh, PRD that we uh, wrote really only had the time and opportunity to expose so much in terms of requirements. Client obviously didn't want an open checkbook or end date. And I think as a result of us finding the delivery took longer, you know, one of the things that we found is that, and, and I think to the client's frustration at times, is that at times we made time-based assumptions, often as a result of having to kind of brief out so many tickets to so many developers just to keep on top of the timetable. You know, so as we started to slip behind with certain bits or as certain requirements kind of became broader, you know, regardless of whether we could buy that extra time or charge for that extra time or not, it was often a case of actually thinking about the same time, how do we onboard extra developers onto that, you know, explain to them what the project's about, you know, get them up to speed, 
you know, and, and, and to try and do that, making as few assumptions as, um, as possible. But despite all those challenges, um, collaborative working really kind of held it together. So on the right-hand side of this picture, you've got me sitting there saying, you know, I really need this product live, get it live. On the client side of it, you have Laura saying, I really need this live, get it live. And then at the kind of product level and the developer level, you know, you had the guys kind of working on it, really striving to kind of build the best possible solution that they could and really actually enjoying the experience of, um, of working and learning together. So in terms of what that journey and experience looked like, um, we're going to go over that now and Ian's going to talk about the front end bit first. Okay, so we wanted to keep the client involved with the front end. <laughs> so we wanted to be able to keep the client involved with the build stage as well. And as part of that, they decided they wanted to use the Zerb Foundation uh, framework. On top of this, we agreed as there was a country of Drupal theme available, and it had the responsive. This is closer to the mic. Yeah, we don't you. hear you. We have a big fan here on Chloe. So okay. Apologies. Okay, let me start again. So we wanted to keep the client involved in the project on the build stage, and for that they chose the Zerb Foundation theme. Uh, with the Zerb Foundation theme, it's obviously a responsive grid system, and there's also a Contrib Drupal theme. Uh, it allowed the client to build the pattern portfolio, the style guides, and the defined site structure. What this allowed was for us to contribute concentrate on the core build and the actual platform. To, to do this, we use Display Suite. And the reason for using Display Suite is, so there's, uh, to me, there's kind of three parts of Display Suite. You have the global benefits, which keeps, keeps the Drupal standards, and it only alters the node output and not the page structure. For the client side, it, it allows them to quickly create and manage view modes manage field ordering from the UI, add dynamic fields to entities without coding, so as an example, creating dynamic fields, being able to embed views inside the node, and then add CSS classes using display suite extras, and also extra functionality with uh, field groups to create containers and divs around items. On a developer point, we can build custom templates in code, which then can be used within multiple places. An example of this is you can create display modes, which can be used within Views and Apache Solar. They link up with features, so for version controlling and pushing between all the platforms, it's easier to manage. So joining everything together. So once again, we can create display modes, create custom templates, which can be used within Views and uh, Apache Solar. It allows the client to alter the templates of the search result output. It allows SpiderSnet to actually use the UI to drag fields up and down, change the regions within the node. And uh, okay, so. Um, with the so this point is about theme inheritance. So one thing with the platform is we use the Zer Foundation base theme. We then created a parent theme, SpiderNet theme, which defined <coughs> the page structure. So sidebars, header, footer, content area. Then the actual whole platform is used as an install profile. And one thing the client wanted to be able to do was install an express site using a dark or light theme. So we had those as a child items. And then on top of that, the client can then go in and create custom themes for the advanced and elite sites, which allowed them to actually override all the template files. And now over to Steve to explain how, how that's all joined. Yeah, so once we had a good idea of the actual site build, uh, and how we were going to put together the front end. Um, we started about putting together a, uh, a distribution. And so a key part of that distribution was to have a, uh, an install profile, which would enable us to take all of those parameters, put them together in those three different variants of sites. So we created out a, um, a custom install profile, which would take in some, uh, some specific parameters, um, 
So some of that key business data for them was to have a dealer ID, and that was their internal piece of information which held everything together from a, uh, from a business perspective. Um, we created it so that it was able to uh, have different default uh, configurations so that you could set the variants. So that was the Express, Advanced, uh, and Elite packages. Um, what came out with those was certain dependencies would be enabled on install. Um, and then also, to retain the flexibility, we created uh, some, some custom elements that would actually look through the code base, uh, code, code base to pull out certain features, and those features could then be enabled directly on the install profile as well. Um, this was also integrated into the Agar install, uh, and I'll cover that a little bit further down the line, but we added into the install profile some, some custom elements that meant that you could pass those arguments directly from Agear through into the install profile. So the initial requirement was to, place, uh, to, to replace our existing uh, system. It was a 10-year-old um, classic ASP system. It had been built out over that period of time and highly customized towards uh, a specific use case. Uh, and our remit was to essentially replace that with uh, something open source. Um, I wanted to retain something open source for the whole stack, which made um, Agear an obvious choice. Um, it had to be scalable as well. Uh, it had to be high, high performance. It uh, had to be extremely repeatable uh, and really robust in that we needed to avoid the existing scenario of copying, copying solutions and actually go for something clean from each install. Uh, it had to be easy to manage for a, for a small team. Um, there was only two guys that we actually uh, upskilled initially. Uh, the team has expanded to include like larger, part, uh, larger parts of the business now. Um, but either way, it had to be something which was going to be very easy for them to manage uh, and a bunch of shared components which could be reused very easily. Um, and then tied into the whole, the whole system was a rebrand uh, and part of that was making the whole solution mobile responsive. Uh, and the final requirement for us was to write out a training schedule which would essentially define a roadmap for each of the, uh, the new team members uh, and basically take them on to the kind of Drupal ecosphere and show them all the different tools that they would need to work through that. So here I've listed a number of the platform features that we had to build out. Um, this was uh, some of the elements that we uh, gathered through the PRD period of time. Um, and all, all of these ended up as uh, custom or features uh, or contrib modules which we built out throughout the process of the, uh, of the build. Um, and so part of this was to define whether or not there was existing solutions for these, uh, of which there wasn't necessarily in most cases, uh, and, and in a lot of cases, um, there was ways of just configuring stuff just directly using features or, 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 or just, just creating certain uh, entities for handling those things. Uh, one of the specific modules that we did um, create into a contrib module throughout this process was the uh, live, chat in, live chat integration. Um, they were using a specific live chat called Contact at Once, so um, that one's now available as a contrib module which we've uh, created throughout the process of this. So as I said, um, it had to be an open source stack, uh, and so we chose Agear. Um, I'm sure most people in the room here know what Agear is, but uh, if you don't, um, Agear is the Nordic god of the sea. Um, but in this case, yeah, it's, it's a Drupal 6 site, but it has a great UI for creating and managing uh, platforms, servers, uh, and site instances. Um, there's a very active community around it, uh, and 40 plus contributed modules which um, handle different, different front end and back end tasks. Um, but ultimately, it's just a Drupal site. So we wanted to give the client something which meant that they had the options to customize it, configure it over time, and essentially give them the abilities to manage that in-house. Um, so Agear refers to different node types of server, platform, and sites, um, but essentially uh, gives you an interface for kind of managing those really easily. So I've added a few credits down at the bottom here of the people that um, essentially are the kind of key resources that, that I used as I was putting together this solution. And uh, 
yeah, without without those guys, we certainly wouldn't have been able to get as far as we did with this. So, um, key part of retaining the uh, the performance aspect of their of their platform was to use uh, the clustered functionality, um, which in in Agear is called a pack. Um, so, in terms of the configuration we have at present, and this is this is likely to change as the as the system scales. Um, we have essentially a load balancer in front of two two web servers. Uh, one web server is essentially the master, uh, and the other web server is the slave. Um, in this instance, we have the uh, the database and the memcache server all on the master. Um, but over time, we're going to distribute the solution over a, a number of other machines. Uh, but there was a, a, a an excellent walkthrough of just how to kind of configure this uh, this cluster, and I've put the the link there of how to kind of put that together, um, step by step walkthrough exactly how to put that together. Um, before we did any development on the platform, we had to uh, essentially define some rules for how everyone was going to interact with the system. Um, as it stands, uh, the project was nine, ten months. Um, and so over that time, we created a lot of code, a lot of features, and a lot of uh, different content types, um, modules, fields. Uh, and so from the outset, we defined a real strict naming convention for how we're going to put that together. Uh, and so that was to use standard prefixes on everything, um, just, just general practice, which I'm sure everyone uses anyway. But in terms of kind of building out something which uh, at some points we had up to nine, ten people all working on at once, uh, it was very key for us to have uh, defined that right from the outset and to have taken the approach of a contrib uh, first, which, again, is best practice anyway, but to make sure that whatever we were doing as part of building the platform was to enforce all of that, um, all of that kind of good best practice stuff right from the outset. Uh, and that included to uh, document any patches um, that have been applied and make that um, part of the repo as well. So some of the key modules that we use as part of the platform build, um, there's a very key search element to the, uh, to, to the platform. So we use the Apache Solar module and Facet API. And we also use Apache Solar sorts um, and Facet API select. There was a key requirement to have drop-down facets rather than standard uh, checkbox or um, radio button facets. So uh, we use the sandbox module for that. Um, uh, we also use the feeds module to a great deal. One of the core requirements of the platform is to pull in feeds from their existing uh, stock management system. Uh, feeds and XPath parser were really key on putting those parts together. Um, Display suite, as, as Ian covered, um, it was a really useful way of us creating different display modes and then kind of exposing that so the client could manage that in a, uh, in a really uh, usable way. Uh, but one of the key modules for the whole platform essentially was Entity Form. Uh, and, and this was essentially the first project that we actually used Entity Form on. Uh, but in terms of the way uh, it provided us the ability to just export different fields, export those, those kind of key forms that made up the platform, uh, it, was a, it was a really important step uh, in putting together the, the platform. Uh, most importantly, because of the key requirements of each site are essentially to drive customers through to those those inquiry forms, and of which there was about I don't know six or seven different types of forms, um, and so it was really key that we had those in version control uh, and and easily uh, editable. So our um, our objectives with the platform going forward. Um, as we progress with the platform, um, we essentially have, have, have now handed it over to the client, but we have kept the ability to be able to uh, add different update hooks. Um, and so moving from, from one version of the platform to the other is just a, just, just a case of including our different changes within an update hook that we supply to the client. Um, but generally, uh, the migration tasks on Agear kind of handle all of those different changes from one version to the next for us. Um, we're studying closely the, uh, the Agear roadmap uh, to, to see where, where this version of the platform lives within, uh, within that roadmap. Uh, and uh, as I said, we've contributed back um, a number of different things. 
Um, we have patches that, should, that, that we've contributed back as part of this and created a number of sandboxes uh, and, and, and a couple of contrib modules uh, th throughout the journey. Um, we'll also be doing this talk, hopefully, at uh, Brighton Drupal Camp. So if you're, um, if you're in the UK around, uh, around January, um, we'll be uh, doing this talk there as well. Um, so we had to upskill the SpidersNet team. Um, that was certainly uh, a steep learning curve to take a team from, uh, from having absolutely no Drupal knowledge uh, and, and, and limited PHP knowledge um, and, and to basically bring them into a world uh, and, and, and show them essentially things which, which we probably take for granted as a community. Um, so one of the first things we did was, was to introduce them to a, a couple of websites. So we sent them to drupalize.me and buildamodule.com uh, and, and gave them the ability to, to essentially kind of start the journey uh, on, on their own whilst we went about creating the platform. Uh, and then once we got to a certain point, uh, we moved that then on to one-to-one uh, to, to -one training. Uh, part of that training was to introduce them to, uh, to Drush. Um, we saw it as a key requirement for them to be able to set up their, their local environments and then be able to synchronize those local environments with their production environments. So we, we uh, worked out a way for them to create shared uh, remote aliases uh, and local aliases so that they could then move those uh, databases and files between, between uh, their local systems and the production systems. Um, we taught them uh, a little extra, like things which maybe were specific to the platform around views uh, and display suite and context, uh, and a great deal of theme inheritance. As Ian covered earlier, there's, there was a number of different levels uh, in terms of theme inheritance, so that was, a, that was a key concept to get across at a very early stage. Uh, and also to describe how to work on the platform, how to use features, how to essentially uh, edit only the parts which needed to be versioned in code uh, and, and separate out the parts which, which were essentially uh, content. Um, and then finally, um, we had to wrap it all up with version control. Um, and version control was something that they hadn't necessarily been using before. Uh, and so it was a key, key concept to, to get across how to use Git, how to use branching, uh, and how to uh, essentially tag different versions of the platform and then uh, push that out onto the, uh, the server. Um, we actually managed the, uh, the code base for the, for, for, for the main platform and each individual site uh, separately so that they could have uh, one track of development specifically for, for the platform and then each of the individual sites could move at like different, different paces. Uh, and finally, we, um, we looked to empower them through through the open source community and through like, providing documentation for everything we did. Uh, so we documented uh, any custom steps that we created that weren't covered by, by Drupal.org documentation. Uh, and we created a quick reference handbook which essentially contained all those key uh, functions and uh, Drush commands that they would need to basically interact with that platform on a daily basis. Uh, and so that, yeah, essentially was was the way that we empowered them and kind of handed things over. Uh, Alex now going to um, talk you through the, uh, the last parts of the talk. Yeah? Um, I would say it was probably about three to four months. Something like that. Yeah. Over a three yeah. to four month time period, but probably about... Um, we probably did about 10 one-to-one -one days with them, which would involve Ian and Steve going there, sitting down with them, setting some objectives, and actually kind of starting to try and build sites as, at the earliest point that we could so that we were working on you know, specific things. And in, in the early days, actually, that's where a lot of the kind of scope creep probably kind of came in because as we were trying things, it was like, well, actually, we'd like you to do this, we'd like you to do this. So there was, there was a lot of it early on where the training kind of blended into... Um, I wouldn't say so. I mean, the um, the guys were very enthusiastic, and 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 throughout 
having done the initial step of getting them to like study up on Drupal on their own, uh, that meant that there was already a dialogue and they were already building sites of their own anyway. So, so it was just basically taking them into how to use the platform rather than kind of how to use Drupal. Yeah, and I think that that was that was a really key step because I think if we had to show them how to use views from from the ground up, then it probably would have added a lot of extra time onto that. So actually when we started the one-to-one -one training, that was, we made an assessment that that was the point where actually we were gonna be starting to talk about the platform and not necessarily about like Drupal things, yeah. I think had they been less receptive to change, it would have been a harder job, but then given that part of the reason for wanting to change was to end up with a solution that was in a slightly more up-to-date technology than what they had been using there as an incentive for them to do it at a personal level anyway so it kind of made sense yeah yeah so um in terms of the client's objectives going forward they're now looking at kind of building out a hub in Drupal to kind of have that as a central resource for documentation to set up their own kind of internal procedures for um reporting issues and bugs for managing feature requests that get driven internally or that get requested by, by clients. They've started to kind of um, improve their kind of team structure. So, you know, very much we kind of train the trainers and then the two guys that we trained have been responsible for taking it out to other members of the team and bringing them up to speed at the same, the same time. Um, now that they've got a platform that, you know, is more reliable and solid, they're in a position where they can actually start to kind of innovate in terms of what they offer as, as, a, as dealer solutions. So, you know, they're able to kind of apply more time and thought to that and less time kind of running around with the ball of string and the rear of sellotape, you know, patching things, things up. And um, they're considering using Drupal in other areas as well. There's, a, there's another eight-year project that they have running to... Um, <coughs> to uh, look at some of their other um, uh, verticals like um, boats, horses, and trucks. And they're also kind of looking at some um, e-commerce projects as well. Uh, just to kind of show you a couple of screenshots of some of the, um, some of the sites that have been kind of launched to date. And uh, I just want to finish on by saying, before we go into questions, that um, I'd like to uh, dedicate this presentation to the um, memory of an ex Miggle employee who, uh, who sadly passed away last month. Um, and he would have still wanted to be in a position where he would have been able to contribute and kind of give. And um, our business would be in a lot, a lot poorer state without him. So, um, any, um, any, any, any questions at all? Thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, what? Uh, how many did you use uh, one repo to uh, keep all of your teams, uh, your profiles, all of your code base in one place, or how did you manage your code? For uh, um, so, um, I, I think I touched on it earlier. We um, we essentially had one repo, which was for the main core. Uh, and that was essentially the Drupal core, the contrib modules, uh, the custom modules and the features. And those were the ones that basically made up the, the platform. Um, and then the principle was to have every site specific folder as it lived on a gear uh, to be another Git repo. Uh, and then essentially in that, in, the, in that repo could then be another themes folder, another modules folder, which could then implement site specific versions of any of the modules that lived in the platform. Uh, and so on, a, on an express uh, site, it was all actually configurable through the UI. So there was, I mean, in theory, there's, there's no need to actually have that child repo. But as soon as it kind of moved to like maybe the advanced and the elite packages, uh, the team would then have the ability to create that site specific folder and version it separately from the, from the platform. Um, uh, just one more thing. Uh, did you have to uh, hack anything into iGear system itself, just uh, making manual changes to, to the code, the, the iGear platform? Uh, no, we, we, we didn't have to hack anything into iGear. I mean, we, we created a custom module that sat um, beside um, iGear. I mean, um, 
I think I, I, I touched on it earlier that we, we created a custom module to essentially pass through arguments from the install uh, profile screen. So when you, when you go to create a site in Agear, um, essentially you get you, usually just the standard options, which is to select the platform you're going to install on. Um, but we added additional parameters there that then got passed through to the install profile and then uh, passed through to the actual site build. Thank you. How quickly do we react to yeah. security updates? Um, I mean, in, in, in theory, it, it should only take a few hours. I mean, like, the, the platform itself now is kind of beyond our responsibility. So, um, but I think uh, if we were to handle those things, I mean, essentially, it's just a case of committing in the new changes to the platform, pushing that, that new version out, like building the new platform on, on the Aegis server, and then migrating the sites across to it. Um, and because we've done everything standard, there's no, there's no kind of, yeah, there's nothing that's sitting outside of that. I mean, it's, it's as long as it takes to migrate all the sites to the new platform. Um, but essentially, they're, they're, the aim is to have about 428 sites living on the platform. So I, I guess that process could take a while. Um, that, that was out of the remit of what we were building. Um, I think looking back on it, I, I would certainly want to put those things in place. Um, but certainly it was, it was out of the remit of what we were building at the time. We, uh, in the build process, uh, we essentially had an install profile which we maintained from, a, from the very outset of the project. And so a successful install was essentially a successful test. Um, but then there was nothing necessarily put in, put in place to kind of handle regression testing. The, um, the, the process was to, for, for them to essentially write an update hook that targets specific features so, um, so that you don't revert all features on a deployment so, so, uh, or, or on a migration. So, um not necessarily. I think we, we discussed at one point kind of splitting out the, the features into kind of core features and like adjustable features. Um, uh, but I think, I think that that was, that was maybe the next phase. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure that they've discussed that internally and that's kind of like part of their plan. I think also with the features as well, so we've kind of delivered it with a certain level of features. And then depending on how granular they want to get with what those individual product variants look like, I think they've already seen some things that they would want to take a feature and split that out into, um, into multiple features. So, yeah, in terms of the things that, I mean, you know, over, over the space of 10 months, given that we'd never done something like this when we started, you know, there are a whole, there are a whole stack of learns for us from, you know, how to spec this project, how to manage it, you know, how to kind of test it, how to train a client, you know, how to get them to, you know, be able to more effectively deploy it. I think that there are, you know, there are certain things that, that we're kind of impressing on them all the time in terms of things to kind of watch out for. Um, but at the same time, we've handed over a product to um, a team in which the most experienced person in, in Drupal terms has been working with the platform or working with Drupal for less than a year. So it's also about trying to kind of get things to a stage where, you know, they're comfortable with being able to kind of move it forward and, and then establish to what extent, you know, they need support or they can actually kind of, you know, run with it, run with it themselves. Oh, okay. So what was what's that prof called? Uh, it's called box 
Bob's like creation. Okay, right. All right, that'd be good. Nice one. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, you said at the start you did the discovery phase and you wrote a requirements document, but it was more work than you expected it to be. Um, did, were you working to like a fixed cost with a client or was it more flexible? More kind of so like initially it was a fixed cost, but then um, once we kind of got into the once we got into the kind of training part of it, we um, uh, we had to kind of then start kind of charging additionally for the for the bits that started to come up, and and, and at that point it started to kind of go into a kind of more agile type approach where um, they would spec out a bunch of things that they needed done. We would look at what availability we had over, you know, the, a period of a month and say, okay, this month we can give you like, you know, another 15 days and then get them to kind of prioritize just, just in kind of one, two, three priority order. And then, and then, and then to kind of talk about how we would map that to the days. Sometimes those days would kind of, uh, you know, depend on actually how much additional money they wanted to kind of spend on the, um, to, uh, to, to, to spend on the project. So there was a point at which it started, went from fixed cost to something that was a little more, a little more open-ended. And, and now we just have a kind of um, rolling support contract where we commit to doing a certain amount of hours. I think we commit to doing eight hours a week. We also put a day's development in our schedule a week for them to be able to call on if they need it. And again, they just prioritise features against against that. Any other questions at all? If um, you get a chance to uh, feedback on what you what you thought of the presentation, that would be that would be useful. Other than that, thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the last day of DrupalCon tomorrow. Your penultimate day of your sprinting on Friday. Have a very nice time this evening. Thanks a lot. Thank you.